Father God in heaven, in Jesus' name we come, Lord. We thank you, Father God, again for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us to come to your house once again to give you honor, to give you glory, to give you all the praise for what you have already done. Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you do. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us again, Father God, just to come into your presence. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives, Father God, that we will be about your business. And yes, Lord, we understand and we know that you have paid the price and the debt has been paid by your son over 2,000 years ago. Lord, we ask you to speak to us today through your word, that your word will make life the better for us and for others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Hallelujah. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. You know who paid the debt? Anybody knows who paid the debt? Did anybody in the room have any debt? Ah, Lord. The debt has already been paid. And Jesus the Christ paid it over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. He's given us another chance. Not that we deserve it, but because of his mercy and his grace. We're in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. In the back of your Bible, right near Revelation. 1 John chapter 2. Uh, tonight we're scheduled to begin at verse 24. And we're going to try to cover both of those pericopes tonight. If we don't, we'll pick it up next week. But in order to understand verse 24, we must go back to verse 22. Verse 22. 2 John chapter 2, verse 22 through 29 is where we will be tonight. We'll see how far we get based on you and how you participate. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We've talked much about the Antichrist. We've said much about false prophets. We've said much about heresy. Heresy. What is heresy? Heresy. Heresy. What is heresy? False doctrine. False doctrine. False teaching. Do we have heresy among us in the 21st century? Give me an example of some heresy. Or some false doctrine or false teaching. Anybody? Name and claim it. Name it and claim it. What does that mean, name it and claim it? Whatever you decide that you want, you just call it out and name it, and God is obligated to provide it for you. My, my, my. So now we're obligating God. So God has become a bellhop. God has become our chauffeur. God has always and has become our bank. God, I name it. Money cometh, money cometh, money cometh. Money coming, money's coming, right? False prophesying. And it's not prophesying, it's prophesying. lying. So we have to understand that we can't name it and claim it and expect God to jump on it. He's not our bellhop, he's not our bank, he's, he is our doctor, he's our healer, he is our encourager, he's our comforter. But the things that we ask for ought to benefit him and not us. Isn't that something? That for which we ask ought to benefit God and not us. Now, we get the luxury, we get the benefit if it benefits us. But the ultimate goal is for it to benefit God, right? We're on planet Earth to please God. We're on planet Earth to glorify him. If he give us some stuff in the meantime, fine. But the ultimate goal is to glorify God. In our character, in our being, in our statements, in our walk, we ought to look to glorify God. Let's look at verse number 22, and we'll try to end up with verse 29. Our text for the night is our, our pericope for the night uh, begins at 24, but in, in order to understand verse 24, you got to go back and understand verse 22 and 23. Who is a liar? Question. Then he answers the question. Who is a liar? Then he asks another question. 
But he who denies that Jesus is the, is the Christ, who is a liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Who is a liar? He who denies that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Who is a liar? He who denies that Jesus Christ is the anointed one. The word Christ means anointed one. The word Christ means the Messiah. The word Christ means that he has come to deliver us. He is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. And then it answers the question. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. He is the Antichrist. We talked about Antichrist. What is the Antichrist? Anybody knows? Anybody want to tell us? One who is against Christ. One who is against Christ. One who opposes Christ. He is the Antichrist. He is the Antichrist. So he who is a liar, he is the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is also the Antichrist. He is the one who opposes Christ. He is the opposition to Christ. He is the Antichrist. So if you're not with Christ, you're against Christ. If you're not with Christ, you oppose Christ. If you oppose Christ, you are really against Christ. Are you with me? So we have to understand that there is no in-between. It's kind of like you used to be on the, on the, on the court. You either with me or against me. You either for me or against me. So there is no there is no splitting in between. Is that correct? So because there is no splitting in between, then now we have what is known as the Antichrist, the opposer of Christ, the one who is against Christ. So now, when we describe the one who is against Christ, he's the one, first of all, who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Secondly, he's a liar. And he's a liar because he denies that, that Jesus is the Christ, the word Christ anointed one. He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. He goes on to give a better description of who the Antichrist is. He denies the Father, and he denies the Son. He denies the Father. Who's the Father? God, our Father. He denies him. He denies that he is the Father. Then he denies that Jesus Christ is Christ. So he denies God the Father and God the Son. So you cannot deny Jesus Christ without denying God. Why? Why can we not deny Jesus Christ without denying the Father? First of all, is that a true statement? Why is that somebody other than Brother Miles? I just started calling names. Man. Why is it that we cannot deny the Father, or rather cannot deny the Son without denying the Father? Everybody want to get theirs in now. They are, they are one. They are three in one. They're, they are one. They are they're three in one. What, who's the third one? The, God, the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so he denies the Father. He denies the Son. Therefore, he is the Antichrist. He is a liar. He denies Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. Verse 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. How can we make that a correct statement? If he denies the Son, he neither, neither does he have the Father. Why is that the case? If he denies the Son, he can't deny, he can't have the Father. Why is that a good statement? Who's, who's answering? Going once, going twice. Because they're one. Any other answer? The Father sent the Son. Any other answer? Other than the fact that the Father has sent the Son, other than the fact that they are one, what else can we say? 
If one denies the father, he denies the son. If he denies the son, he denies the father. I'm looking for something here. You can't deny one without denying the other. Anybody else? I'm looking for something. I'm probing. The fact is, you cannot have the father without having the son simply because you have to go through the son in order to get to the father. You have to go through the son. John chapter 10, St. John chapter 10 says that I am the door to the sheepfold. No man comes to the father except he comes through me. I oftentimes tell the story of how my daughter would have friends over. They would want something out of the refrigerator. Guess what? They didn't just open the refrigerator and get it out. They didn't just go to the stove and take it off. They would say, can you ask? Will you ask? Please ask your dad and mama, can we have this? Such it is with Jesus. We can't get to God without going through Christ. Yes, and so when we deny the father, we also deny the son. Whoever denies the son does not have the father either. If you deny the son, you deny the father. If you deny the father, you deny the son. There is no usurping authority. When men talk about Jesus that are not following the Christian doctrine, they will say that Jesus was just a prophet. And then they were even error to say he was a good prophet. And then they were even error more to say he was just another man. What's your response to that? Anybody? He's the son of God. Why is it important for us to know that he's the son of God? Why is that important? He's the only way. Jesus, why did Jesus come to earth? To die. Why did Jesus live? To die. He made his way here to die. He didn't come here to, to heal the sick. He didn't come here to raise the dead. He did these things so that men would believe. And that's what the false prophets claim today. They say, come fill up the Colosseum and bring me your money. And when you bring me your money, you will be blessed. And if I send you a cloth, I'm going to get you blessed. And the, the bigger the offering, the bigger the blessing. And people just flood into Colosseums. And they just send their money by mail. And they just give and give because one man said, you will walk again. You will raise the dead. Let me tell you something. When a guy comes to town, and he sets up a tent or he comes to the South Coliseum, he doesn't have to, if he's really doing it for the Lord, he doesn't even have to go and visit NRG Stadium. He doesn't have to go to Toyota Stadium. He can just go down to MDMs and just walk the halls. He can go to Herman Memorial and just walk the halls. He can go, and surely he can go to Texas Children. Children who have done nothing wrong physically, who has not ever, that was born with, with problems. Tell him the next time, come on, go with me. I believe in you. And take him and sit him in the ICU room and say, there he is. Why don't we do that? We're scared to challenge them that way. Why don't we, why don't we ask them? Ask them, how, how many dead people have you raised? Now, let me tell you, when, when you, you know that, that he's a real prophet, it's when he goes to the funeral home after the embalming has taken place. When there's no more blood running warm in his body. When there's formaldehyde present. Tell him to come. So why do we have hospitals if we got men who can just walk around and command God to do things? Of course, God does things when we live righteous for him, and we'll talk about that later. God does supernatural things as we live for him, but it's not to benefit us. It's not to line our pockets with money. It's just the simple gospel truth to do God's will and to call men to fellowship in Jesus Christ. And if we focus on giving men to fellowship 
to, to become totally dependent on God, we've done our part. Because Jesus came for one reason, that's to die. And when Jesus shows up, he doesn't show up in a mansion. Shows up in a stable. Shows up with strips of cloth wrapped around him. He shows up and they lay him in a hog trough. Now, let me just correct the naysayers. That doesn't mean that preachers have to ride donkeys in order to be righteous. One lady said, you see, you see, Jesus came riding in on a donkey and these preachers driving all these cars. Well, first of all, the donkey that he rode up on was the Cadillac during that time. Are you with me? So, so if we were riding donkeys today, if we were riding horses other than for gamemanship today, Jesus would ride in on one. So don't be so hard on the preacher. LeBron James drives what he wants to drive. Steph Curry drives what he wants to drive. J.J. Watt drives what he wants to drive. Why can't the preacher drive what he wants to drive? Are you with me? So let's look at it. When we deny Christ, when we not deny the Father, we are called, when I say we, I mean them, they are called the Antichrist. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son, verse 23, he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. You can't have one without the other. And you can't have the third person, the triune God, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, without having the rest of them. So when the Holy Spirit shows up, he shows up when we, we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. When Jesus shows up, the Holy Spirit shows up. God the Father shows up. You can't have one without the other. I think I said to you two weeks ago, stop getting in lines to be, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we use the word feel, we mean we want to make sure that the Holy Spirit is activated in us. We want to make sure that the Holy Spirit is controlling our actions and our thoughts. We want the Holy Spirit to not only dwell in us, but to unction us, to tell us what to do, to say, oh, no, don't go that way. We want the Holy Spirit to be the one who talks to us and speaks to us. And that's why the songwriter says he walks with me. He talks with me and he tells me I am his, his own. God, the Holy Spirit, he does it. So he says, he who denies the son also denies the father. Verse 24. Therefore, let that, the word that, focus on that. Therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. Therefore, let that abide in you. In other words, we got to go back up to verses 24 and 23. What is that? That that is the truth. That that is the fact that you can't have the father without the son. The word that refers to the fact that, that if you abide in him, he abides in you. He says, therefore, let that, let this thought, let this memory, let this thing abide in you. The word abide means to remain. The word abide means to stand up in you. The word abide means to tarry in you. And the word abide means to stay in you. To tarry, to stand, to remain, and to stay. So let this word abide in you. The reason why he has to go through all these changes is because false prophets were getting to him. They were believing what the false prophets had to say. In the country, they would say, they just pigeon dropping. Brother McGill, what is pigeon dropping? Pigeon dropping. <laughs> Anybody else? Pigeon dropping. You have you heard the word pigeon dropping? What would happen? What would happen is when you live in the country, the city slickers would come to the country, and they would drive down these dusty roads, 
And they would tell you some things that you need to hear, some things you've been praying about, some things. Let me tell you something. If you have a child and you're in a coliseum or you're in the country and a guy walks by and he says, God told me that your child is going to be all right. Has he really told me anything? God told me that whatever you're dealing with, he's going to fix it. Has he really told me anything? Now, if he starts talking about children, you can ask any parent alive. If you got one child, you're going to have an issue sooner or later. So when he comes and he prophesies that what you're going through with your child, God told me it's going to be all right. Has he really told you anything, Sister Brown? Whatever your child is going through, God told me. And see, when, you, when they pigeon dropping, they give you enough information for, it to, for you to believe in it, and then they leave with money. They leave with money. They, leave, they don't leave with chicken. They don't, they don't leave with pork and beef. They leave with money. Are you with me? And so we have to understand that, that when we walk in the Father, the truth is present. He says, therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. There is no new truth on the market. I remember when the new age theory came out, where this is a new age thing and we're doing a new thing and you don't need that Christianity thing. You need to follow this this way. That's why I'm kind of leery of yoga. Uh-oh, I hit somebody. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's good stretching, exercise, it's good. But when you start meditating, and when you start getting involved with, with nature, and when you start talking about uh, my parents that are my foreparents that's been dead for years, you are, th- you are walking on thin ice. Heresy, if it's not already set in, it's right around the corner. God told me, he said, he said, my baby was in trouble. His mom had just passed away. He said, my baby was in trouble, and, and the lady had a hard time in labor, and the doctor said that you may have to cut this baby loose because the baby going to cause the woman to die, and you, can't, you, you just can't have the baby. And, and God blessed the woman to have the baby. The baby lived, and the child lived. And the best that the daddy could do is say, I knew my mama wasn't going to let that baby die. That's the best he could come up with. His mama that had been dead. What's wrong with that, Sister Whitlock? I knew my mama wasn't going to let that baby die. What's wrong with that? Anything wrong with that? What's wrong with that? So you don't think his mama... Made sure that baby lived. Come on, Sister Whitlock. Tell the truth and change it. No. So what could he have said that would have been beneficial? God has made a way again. We praise the Lord. We thank the Lord. For God has blessed us. I'm so, I'm, I'm so sad he didn't ask me. I'm so sad. that All he had to do is say, Lord, we thank you. For blessing this baby to be born healthy instead of his mama. who pe- Now, don't you know if the mama could bless the baby, the mama still would be here because the mama could bless herself? Yes. Folk walk around with rabbit feet. So the rabbit can give them good luck. The rabbit didn't have good luck himself. Because he lost his foot. Therefore, he lost his life. If the rabbit couldn't keep himself alive, how is it going to help you stay alive? Back home, you had Miss Delmar and Mother Teresa, and they were, they were ones who prophesied into your life. They used Ouija boards, and they used tarot cards. And, and I just looked at that thing one day, Sister Woods, and I said, now, she living on the side of 82 in a trailer, a run-down trailer. And she can tell me my future and how blessed I'm going to be. But she's not living a blessed life herself. But she was bringing in the dough. 
because people believed it. Miss Delmar, they probably dead and gone now. Miss Delmar and Sister Teresa, they would bring, people would just give them, give them money. They flood them with money. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. Just because you go to college and learn some new things, just because you go to a sociology class or a psychology class or a mythology class, don't change what you've been taught. Sunday school is right. Your preacher has been right for years. You turn 18, you go to college, you got, you're going to come back and tell your mom and dad off and how they need to be worshiping like this. That's part of the problem that, that's, that's with um, contemporary music. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing, much of it, has nothing to do with the word of God. It makes you feel good. It makes you jump. It makes you bebop. And churches are flooded. And they do not abide by the word. Jesus said, let this word abide in you. John says, let this thing that you were taught from the beginning, the truth from the beginning, let it abide, abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then he gives us a promise. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. If you allow this word, if you allow what God has promised, if you allow what you've been taught from the beginning to abide in you, guess what? He says right here in the text, he says, whatever you do, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. If you abide, you abide in this truth, you abide, in, you abide in this word. This word has to be saturated in your heart. The word saturation, saturation is an is a electronic term when you take a, a transistor and it's saturated. Meaning it has all that it can hold or maintain. You ought to be saturated with the word. You ought to, know, you ought to stop running from Jehovah's Witnesses. They come to your house and whoop you in your house, they all whip you. Don't let anybody come to your house and whip you at your house. Because you ought to know the word. You have to saturate yourself with the truth of God. Verse 25. And this is a promise that he has promised us. What is the promise? Eternal life. How long is eternity? Forever. How long is forever? How long is forever, forever? Eternal life. Everlasting life. He has promised us based on this word. He says that, let that abide in you. Let that word abide in you. And as that word abides in you, guess what happens? God has promised us eternal life. Eternal life. What we have to understand is all this stuff we have, it's temporary, but God promises us eternal life. All the things we've been praying about is temporary, but God has promised us eternal life. And the only way that life comes is through the Son. You can't get it any other way. You can go to the fountain of youth all your life. You're going to get out of here. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, earth to earth, or earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, or dust to dust, ashes to ashes, earth to earth. You're going to get out of here. From the earth you came and from the earth you will and shall return. We put a lot of time and a lot of effort into temporary things when God says we can have eternal lives. Our lives can be eternally Fulfill, and we can have abundant life while we're here. Don't be like people who work all their lives and never enjoy what they get. Are you with me? Don't work, because some of us work 60 years to enjoy five years, and then because we didn't enjoy it while we worked, we don't get to enjoy it after we retire. The Bible says that we are to leave an inheritance for our children's children. 
but he didn't say all of it. Are you with me? When I leave here, my children got to work. I had to, right? From the age of 13, been getting after it. In college, in college, I had to get out, get out of college and go back to the field and chop some more. Until I discovered Jackson, Mississippi, where I can pick tomatoes and throw knockouts out. And, I mean, I, I worked at, and then I, I discovered that I could work at Burger King and didn't have to go to the field. All I had to do is stand behind the brawler and work graveyards and get off at 2 o'clock in the morning. Man, I was in hog heaven. I can get off at 2 and didn't have to get up at 2 and go to the cotton field. And now children don't want to get up at 10 o'clock to go work. We have to understand that these things are temporary. We work all our lives to get temporary stuff while God promises and God has promised us eternal life. But it only comes from the Father through the Son by way of the Holy Spirit. Yes? Verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. He says that there are some people that are intentionally deceiving you. He says they try to deceive you. Are you going to let them do it? He said there are some people that intentionally go out of their way to deceive you. This word deceive means to seduce. To put you in a wonder. To cause you to stray away. There are people while we are asleep. They are sitting in boys rooms trying to deceive us. He says, be vigilant. Be on God. Stay with the Lord. Let the Lord guide you because you have eternal life, but you can have abundant life on planet Earth right now. He says, I'm writing these things to you that you would no longer be deceived. Deceived that you would, you would, you would no longer be seduced in such a way till you have wandering characteristics. You know, some people can so be, be so easily deceived, number one, because of greed. Because enough is never enough. And they lose all they ever worked to, to accomplish. They lose everything they've done in life. They lose great reputations over one moment of greed. Brother Miles, you're driving down the street, and all of a sudden the armed truck back door flies over, and money's just flying everywhere. What, you, what do you do? <laughs> he says, Scare! What, what do you do, Brother McGill? What do you do when, when money just flying everywhere? I mean, the armored truck, though, you didn't rob the truck. You didn't make them pull off the road. You didn't run them off the road. Brother McGill, what do you do, man? I mean, money just flying. I mean, it's just green stuff everywhere. Look like it's falling from heaven, huh? What do I do or whatever I'm supposed to do? No, I want to know what, what do you do? <laughs> I mean, you, you got stuff just, I mean, stuff you've been working all your life for, stuff that you've been, you've been praying that the Lord gives you, and all of a sudden, a miracle happens. Okay, tell me what you're supposed to do, then tell me what you do do, what you're willing to do. Keep going? Why would somebody keep going? Say, what's this, bro? Stop and help them? Do you, do you realize that some people just can't feel money in their hand and leave it there? So, so what do you do? You, do you stop and, or you just keep going? I, I'm telling you, I just remember so plainly and clearly in 1970 when the sheriff in Mississippi said, if you find a gun, leave it alone, don't touch it, tell an adult. So, if you find something that's not yours, don't touch it, leave it alone, tell God. 
Leave it alone. I, I was mowing yesterday, and I was in, it, was, it was in my yard. I was mowing, I, and I, I looked down there. It had been raining, and the wind had been blowing, and there was a dollar bill laying there. It was in my yard. I didn't want to cut it up with the lawnmower. So what would I have done differently if it was $500? So Sister David says, you wouldn't stop. What would you have done? Oh, you got to pick it up. You don't know who it belongs to. I think I put it in this pocket. My work clothes pocket. It was in my yard, right? One day, Brother Dixon and I was coming out of his shop, and it was right there off of, of 90. We came out of the shop, and there was some money laying on the ground. And we picked it up, uh, two, three dollars, right? And we walked out going toward the truck, and then it had rain, and there were puddles. There was money laying in that puddle, there was $20 here, there was $10 here, and we just started walking the trail. No one showed back up. We didn't rob anybody. No, I didn't split it with him. I got mine, he got here. Are you with me? So what we have to understand is make sure we're living a righteous life. Because at the end of the day, God has given us eternal life, and there are people that will deceive you. Now, you all may think that I was bad off, but doing my my early 20s and mid-20s, I would go to Sharptown Mall, and, and I would have some gift cards, and I would do two things while I was at the mall, and I would do them at two separate times because they didn't go together, you know. When I would go to the mall, I would pray, Lord, send me somebody that I can witness to that I can lead to Christ. And every time I prayed that prayer in that mall, I would stand on the second floor. Every single time I prayed that prayer, God sent somebody by. Either I approached them or they approached me and I, I led them to Christ. But there were other times I went to Sharpstown Mall and I had gift cards that had been totally used. And now I want to see how many honest people in the mall. It was zero dollars, Brother Whitlock, on this, these cards. I would take about three or four at a time. Then I, had, I used every penny of it. And I would walk through the mall and I would be filling with my wallet and I would intentionally drop one. And then I would go to the corner where they didn't see me and watch who picked it up. Now, they saw me drop it, but they never, not, one, not but one person out of about 50 people, one person called me back. So does that say out of 50 people, only one person, 2% of the people in the world would be honest about it? So that one that would bring me that empty card back, then it became my responsibility to give him $10. And that was just the survey I did on a regular basis. They saw me drop it, but they didn't call me back. When we look, when we look at the text, it says, don't be deceived by the devil. Don't, don't be deceived. I think I told you all this story before. Uh, Mama worked in Bells only 30 miles away from Indianola, and one day she... She came home with a big old bag of money. And this lady's name and phone number was on the bag. Mama called a woman. Dad said, well, let's see what the Lord blessed us with. <laughs> it was like $30,000. And that day they weren't equally yoked. They agreed on how to rear the children, but they didn't agree on the money. Mama said, leave that money alone. It doesn't belong to us. She called a lady, and the lady came by the house and picked up $30,000. And she was an old lady in her 80s. She could barely walk. And she said, baby, I thank you for this. This was my life savings. And I tell you what happened. I got it out the bank. I put it on the back of my car, and I drove off. That was one time Dad said, look at God. Look, look at what God has done. <laughs> but he did not get one single penny of that one. So we have to understand there will always be deceptions. 
Either a person deceiving you or things deceiving you or situations deceiving you, conditions deceiving you. You have to make sure you be the judge and judge fairly and righteously. There will always be self. Verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. The anointing which you have received from him. Who is the him? Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, right? The anointing, this word anointing is the endowment, the unction. God unctions us. God endows us by way of the Holy Spirit. This anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Who abides in you? The Holy Spirit abides in you. And because the Holy Spirit abides in you, then he unctions you. How many people have heard what the Holy Spirit said, don't do and you did it anyway? Okay, let me ask it this way. How many of you have heard the Holy Spirit say, do and you did it anyway? How many people have ignored the Holy Spirit? How many people obey the Holy Spirit? The Bible says that this anointing in you, this unction in you, it, this unction, this endowment, God has greatly endowed us. When you hear men talking about cars and how many horsepowers they have in it, th those cars have, have tremendous horsepower. They can take off phew, zero to 60 in a matter of seconds. It's because they have an engine in them. They've been endowed with the engine, with the force, with the anointing. They've been endowed with something. That they can hit, they can hit it and it will jump from zero to 60 in a matter of seconds. The problem with Christians is that we have been endowed with the Holy Spirit and with the unction. And we have chosen not to use him or use that unction when he tells us to. We, we choose not to use it. We choose not to submit to him. We choose not to go with him. We choose to do what we have experienced, what we, we have done before, what we've seen happen before. One of the worst statements a person can make in a vision meeting is, Reverend, we've never done that before. Reverend, we've never seen that done before. Well, you haven't seen everything on the world in the world either. Reverend, I don't think we got the people to do that. Well, we're not dependent on the people. We're dependent on God. God has endowed us. He has unctioned us. He's equipped us to do great things. This anointing, which, which you have received from him, abides in you. He dwells in you. He lives in you. He remains in you. He stands up in you. He tarries in you. He stays in you. He stays in you. He speaks to us. He talks to us. He tells us right or wrong. And you do not need that anyone teach you. I need to clear this one up before you just run out of here half cocked. He says you do not need anyone to teach you. What is he really saying? Is he saying that those of us who are standing and sitting in this room... And those of us who are online, we don't really need teaching. Is that what he's saying? So he's not saying that you don't need anyone to teach you. But what he is saying is that you have been trained well. You've been taught the gospel. You have been taught the word of God. Back to verse 22, 23, 24. You've been taught this word. Don't let anything that's contrary to this word mislead you. Or deceive you. So you're not walking around desiring teachers, I know. Go and looking for somebody to tell you something differently. When you leave home and you join yourself with another church, you're looking for a church that's solid, that's fundamentally sound in the word of God. You don't look for a church just because it's packed with people. A lot of people going to hell. You are looking for a church that is sound doctrine, 
in the staff is sound doctrine, in the people are hearing the word. It was just so embarrassing. They wasn't embarrassed, but it was embarrassing to me. I was teaching at a mega church in this city. People were asking me questions, and every time they asked me a question, I said, well, let's go to this verse. They asked me another question, let's go to this verse. They asked me another question, let's go to this verse. And after the third time, they said, we don't want, we said, all you doing is talking about the Bible. We don't want to hear that. We want you to tell us what you have to say. I mean, a well-respected church in the city, a mega church. And I'm saying to myself, are y'all being taught anything over here? I mean, I know you got a bunch of people, but for you to even come out and then the rest of them begin to support. Yeah, girl, I know that's right. For you to even ask me a question and then want my opinion more than you want to hear the word, something is wrong, something is wrong. So you don't need to de desire pe uh, teachers that are not teaching the word of God, the unadulterated word. You don't need anyone to teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you according to all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him or abide in him. So it says, whatever you do, don't don't just get caught up in things. Don't get caught up in the feel good moment. Don't get caught up in a brand new doctrine. The Bible teaches that there is nothing new under the sun. The same things that they've been dealing with when it comes to seduction, when it comes to uh, an attitude of walking away. The Bible teaches that there will come a day of apostasy where men will walk away from sound doctrine. They will walk away from the church. Can we identify today? Let me tell you, the coronavirus just revealed who we really are. When it comes to loving the Lord, when it comes to church attendance, the coronavirus revealed what was already in us. What we were already thinking, what we were already feeling. You know, many have said, you don't have to go to a church building. The church is in you. Now, that's the only scripture they know, but they want to pull that one out when it benefits them. Verses 28 and 29. The last pericope is found in these two verses. Verse 28. And now little children abide in him that when he appears. Now little children. He's talking about these newborn uh, Christians. Says abide in him. Stay in him. Who is him? Stay in the Holy Spirit. Stay in Jesus Christ. Stay in God. That when he appears, who is he? When Jesus appears, we will have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. When Jesus gets back, some people are going to be ashamed. And it's our responsibility today to tell them you ought to be ashamed of yourself. That's what Dorothy Steele told me. 11th grade, room number two, across the hall from, from the cafeteria, Gentry High School, my 11th year, she was a senior. She said, you don't have to keep living your life like you're living. She said, you can be changed. And she said, you don't need, you don't need a church. You don't need a, a song leader. You don't need a choir. You don't need a good talk. You don't even need a preacher. You can be changed right here, right now in Ms. Bonner's sixth period class. Where was it, Sister Whitlock? Across the hall from the cafeteria. What room was it? Room number two. About 2.30 in the evening. On a Tuesday, May 6th. She said, what you must do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. It says that you should not be ashamed when he appears. You should not be ashamed. He says that when he appears, we may have confidence. We need to have confidence. We must have the freedom. We must have the assurance. 
Are you assured of who Jesus is? Are you assured of where you will be when you die? Are you assured that Jesus is coming back to get you and not them? The video is out there of a church, a huge church, and there are people in the room just moaning, groaning, and crying. Then a car pulls up and the guy runs in the building, runs in the church. What happened? What happened? And the people in the church explained to him that we were sitting here having church. And all of a sudden, some of the people just got out of here. They just left. They, they, there were no holes in the building. There were no windows broken. But see, here's their clothes. Everywhere you see empty clothes, those are people that left here. And then it shows a picture. You know they got to put this picture in there. Of the pastor walk around in the pulpit wondering what happened to you knew they had to stick that in there. And people are mourning and groaning and crying. The Bible says, whatever you do, you need to not be ashamed when he comes back. So how do we not be ashamed? We make sure we handle our business now. Trust him. It says, and now little children, abide in him, abide in him, live in him, dwell in him. That when he appears, we may have confidence. This word confidence is assurance and freedom. And not be ashamed before him at his coming. One of these days, Jesus is going to crack the sky. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him in midair. And you don't know the minute. You don't know the time. You don't know where you would be. But can't you see airplane pilots that are saved in midair, 30,000 feet in the air? All of a sudden, the pilot disappears. The woman about to serve, the, the, the attendant is about to serve you your last little drink, and all of a sudden, phew, the drink falls on the floor and she gets out of here. Isn't that something? He says that we don't have to be ashamed when he appears. It says abide with him. Have the confidence that you're going to be with him. Verse 29, and I quit. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So John talks about the fact that you need to be born again. You need to be saved. And if you are saved, you're going to practice righteousness. If you're not saved, you're going to practice unrighteousness. And when you practice unrighteousness, you need to understand that when the anointing is in you, it ought to give you an inkling when you're going wrong. The anointing, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. He talks to us. Let me ask you a question. The last time you went off, did you know you were going off? Did you know you were doing the wrong thing? Or did it sneak up on you? Did the devil make you do it? Let me give you a word. The Bible says that we are led astray by our own fleshly desires. We have chosen to do these things. And check this out. The devil knows your history. The devil knows your past. He knows which buttons to push. And when he pushes that button, he knows that here, here Cora goes. <laughs> rolling her neck, shaking her head, rolling her eyes. You got me now. The wise writer says that he who has no control over his own spirit is, is like a, a city whose walls are broken down. Has no defense, no security. Your walls are broken down. Let me tell you, the devil is looking to tempt you on what he knows about you. He's going to remind you every time of who you used to be. And when he reminds you of who you used to be, remind him of who you are. But you can't do it if you do the same thing you used to do. He says, live righteously. He says, this endowment in you, this unction in you, the Holy Spirit in you leads you and guides you 
into all truth. So the moral of these two pericopes is that make sure you walk in him. Make sure the Holy Spirit abides in you. And make sure that he's activated in you. Where you don't become what you used to be. Everybody got a nickname, right? You got an old you and a new you, whether you name him or her or not. Now, do you want to see Lula or you want to see Lulu? <laughs> Your choice. And it's her. Look, see that? See that? I told you. She, see, see that? I told you. It, it, it's your choice. I mean, but in all actuality, it's really her choice. And, and I can say this. So, so Helen Graham will tell you in a minute. Do you want Helen or you want Kay? Now, which one you want to? I'm gonna tell you a secret, brother Miles. I've seen both of them. Do you want Cora or you want Cora? In other words, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to unction us, to lead us into all righteousness, lead us into godliness. And the only way you can do it is that you're born again. The door of the church is open. And you must trust. This is a good, this is a good uh, day, a good time to focus on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, Good Friday is on April 15th. I think I'll say it again. Good Friday is on April the 15th. Let me say it one more time. Good Friday is on April 15th. Let me tell you, it was a Good Friday when they killed my Lord and your God. When you look at things and how awful they treated him, you would think it was bad Friday. But it was a good Friday in the fact that Jesus Christ took a cross. They killed him for your sins and mine. No longer does the preacher have to lay his hand on a goat that has now become the scapegoat. And the goat runs into the woods carrying away our sin because the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself, has carried our sins up on a skull hill called Calvary. He died on that Calvary hill. He died on the cross. After he died, they pierced him in his side. Out came blood and water for your sins and mine. You see, Jesus didn't fall because the cross was so heavy, because it was a wooden cross, because the cross was heavy. He fell because he was carrying your sins and mine on Calvary. They took him to Calvary. They nailed him tight. He died on Calvary. They took him down off the cross, laid him in Joseph's brand new tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. They, they laid him in his tomb. It was an unused tomb. It was a, it was, it was a new tomb. They laid him in Joseph's brand new tomb. But early the third day morning, he rose with all power. And the Bible says if you can just believe this story, you can be saved right here, right now, today. If you want to trust him, will you join me in prayer and um, repeat after me and invite Jesus Christ into your life? The door is open. This is your opportunity to get to know him so the Holy Spirit can unction you. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new creature. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. We believe that if you honestly prayed this prayer, you're now born again. And when Jesus cracks the sky, you don't have to be ashamed. You can rejoice and you have the freedom to rejoice in him. If you listen to me and you don't have a church home or you're in between church homes or you, you don't have a church home that you're attending on a regular basis, this is your moment. 
I, am a, I invite you to the New Beginning Church, Southeast Houston, Texas. Inbox us and let us know that you want to be a part of a New Beginning Church, this great church in Southeast Houston, Texas. It is now offering time, and it's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. And rejoice for the privilege of giving unto the Lord. For those of you who will give electronically, you can do so by going to Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your offerings, your tithes to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. During our prayer time, we want to remember these in prayer. Derek Woods, Henry Hall, Gwen Dorsey, Ava Lane, Abel Frosto, Tommy Hemingway Jr., Jonathan Garcia, Julian Corey, and Destiny Garcia, Tanisha Refin Re Re <coughs> Renegro, and Sister Lydia Darrington. We want to lift those in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We thank you for money. We thank you for increase. We thank you for income. We thank you for jobs. We thank you, Father God, for keeping us in our health and our strength. Bless us as we come to give unto you, Father God, and bless every giver. Now, Lord, we pray, Father God, that you bless these whose names we have called. Bless us, Father God, that we will remember them and keep them in our prayers. Now, Lord, we ask you to heal and touch, comfort and deliver as only you can. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Those of you who are present, will you come now and bring forth your offering? And it's about Jesus that wails from the dead. It's not about money. It's not about and it's about Jesus who rose from the dead. Lulu. When he takes the final law, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yes, Lord. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for this privilege. We actually bless us as we move forward. We pray for the choirs that come to lift up your name and praise. We ask you, Father God, to bless us that we will continue to hear from you. Bless us with safety and bless us, Father God, with compassion. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We are uniting the church. We're strengthening families. We're supporting schools. We're empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32, you are dismissed. Thank you so much for joining us.